from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Authorities in Brazil have denied the request by former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva to attend his older brother's funeral. 79-year-old Genival Ignacio da Silva died Tuesday from lung cancer. The police alleges there were no police officers to guarantee Lula's safety or helicopters available to transport him. According to the law, prisoners are allowed to attend such services. Even when Lula was arrested during the dictatorship, he was allowed to attend his mother's funeral in 1980. Also in Brazil, victims of the Dam Burst disaster are being laid to rest in the town of Brumadinho. Friends and relatives carry coffins to burial sites at the local cemetery as workers accommodate to sudden need for more graves. The death toll has risen to 84 and almost 300 remain missing, according to rescuers working at the site. Only 48 people have been identified so far. Why would you build an administrative area under a dam? This was murder. They just buried my niece. My brother-in-law is missing. Innumerable colleagues. And then, how many orphans? How many sons? How many fathers? How many friends? How many neighbors? And they come saying that it was an accident? And the mourning process in the local community is continuing. Victims of the dam disaster have been remembered in the town at a candlelight vigil. It's like this. I didn't lose anyone in my family, but I did feel loss because Brumadinho is a family. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone is united. As much as we don't actually know someone who died in disaster, you've seen that person. You pass them by in the street. You meet them on the bus, in the supermarket, at church. So that shows how united we are, how much strength we have, and that shows that we can get through this together. And the Paropeba River is running red and brown after the mining dam collapse to spill sludge into the water. The toxicity of the mineral lace of sludge is not yet known, but an indigenous community downstream complained that fish it relies on for its livelihood were dying. Most of us here are very rural, riverside people, so we use the Peruopeba River to feed ourselves. It gives us fish, we use it to water our plants, and now we can't do this anymore. So many people have been affected by the dam breaking. Now to Venezuela, the president of the National Constituent Assembly has joined a demonstration to support the government of Nicolás Maduro. Diosdado Cabello, along with thousands of Maduro supporters, marched in the city of Barquisimeto to defend the Bolivarian Revolution and Venezuela. Demonstrators said they want to protect the sovereignty and integrity of the country. In the last two years, we have done five elections. There's no country in the world that can say that. There's not a single country that can say they are in regular touch with their people so they can make informed decisions. The last election on the 20th May 2018. Who do you vote for that time? Maduro. Who do you vote for that time? Maduro. We voted for Nicolás Maduro. Russian authorities have reacted to the new pressure made by the United States against Venezuela. Our correspondent, Hans Eloro, has the details. A Kremlin spokesman has said that a military intervention in Venezuela will lead to extreme negative consequences and that will not solve the country's international problems. In addition, he also spoke about the new U.S. Treasury measures against the Venezuelan oil company PDVSA. The Russian Chancellor, Sergei Lavrov, also expressed that the United States is seeking to confiscate the Venezuelan oil funds. He also came out against the John Volta regarding the presence of 5,000 U.S. soldiers in Colombia, rejecting the interventionist maneuvers predicted by the United States. Russia rejects the intervention from the United States and the countries that are part of the self-styled Lima Group. A, a correspondent, Hans Eloro. And for an analysis on the current situation in Venezuela, here's a correspondent, Alina Duarte. Uh, with his team. The coup d'etat in Venezuela, orchestrated by the U.S. and the Venezuelan opposition, continues and is operated publicly. 
After the decision of the Treasury Department of freezing $7 billion in assets of the government and of the Venezuelan Central Bank, it was the State Department, followed by the spokesman of Washington, who confirmed that this is the way to finance the self-proclaimed President Juan Guaido. What we're trying to do today is look at the issues involved in disconnecting the illegitimate Maduro regime from its sources of revenues and finding ways to transfer those revenues uh, to the new legitimate government of the National Assembly President. So we're, we're looking at all the options. And if there is still doubt about the interest of the U.S. government behind these movements, they confirm it. We're looking at the oil assets. That's the single most uh, important income stream to the government of Venezuela. We're looking at what to do to that. We want everybody to know we're, we're looking at all this very seriously. We don't want any American businesses or investors caught by surprise. But for many, the interests of Washington are not a surprise. Venezuela has a huge amount of oil, of gold, of diamonds, of really every mineral you could ever want. So Venezuela has the, uh, the ability to become independent. And for the United States, the only way to really get rid of Venezuela is to either neutralize the country by mounting a coup, or even better, divide it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a civil war. And I think we've seen this over the years. This was the U.S. strategy, certainly. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., in front of cameras, the opponents of the government of the president, Nicolas Maduro, meet with the State Department, the White House, and some congressmen, some of them confessing on TV who are the orchestrators of the coup. This isn't about convincing anybody. It's about a team. We are working together with Mike Pompeo, with the Department of State, with John Bolton, and his team from the National Security Council, and also with the president and vice president who believe in this. So we just contribute with our opinions and advice. But at the end, the U.S. president takes the lead. He makes the final decisions. The president was in favor of this from the beginning. This isn't a thing he didn't want. To do. The White House's desire to continue this strategy of pressure against the Venezuelan government could lead, according to several experts, to a military intervention or to a civil war. Alina Duarte, Telesur, Washington, D.C. And President Maduro has strongly rejected the U.S. sanctions, calling them illegal. He also described the Citco company takeover as a robbery. John Bolton. John Bolton has announced the imposition of a series of measures of so-called sanctions, which are unilateral, illegal, and are against the UN Security Council. They are unilateral, illegal, immoral, and criminal. With these measures, they are trying to steal the Citgo company away from us, a company of all Venezuelans. Be alert, Venezuela. The United States has decided to take the path of robbery of the Citgo company from Venezuela. This is an illegal path. I have given the necessary instructions to the owner of the Citgo company to start the political and legal procedures before the U.S. and international courts to defend the property and wealth of Citgo. Venezuela's oil minister has said he is studying possible legal steps to take in response to the sanctions. We have all the will to maintain operations with the companies that have our supply contract, but at the same time, we want to protect the providers of supplies and material that have contracts with PDVSA and could be affected by not being able to supply those materials and supply to PDVSA. We are assessing whether any judicial and administrative actions that PDVSA must undertake would be suspended via force majeure. But at the same time, PDVSA can, under their contractual conditions, fulfill some of the commitments that we have in the North American market. We are evaluating all actions to limit as much as possible the impact on the world petroleum market. And the Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza said the United States has proven it only wants to get its hands on Venezuela's oil. He said it is what fueled the U.S. support for the attempted coup. Spain's Podemos party said it is concerned over the ongoing situation in Venezuela. The party's international secretary warned that any military intervention in Venezuela's affairs could lead to a civil war. Mr. Guaido has said that military intervention is something that is being considered, and he has asked the armed forces many times to go against the government. So the plan for the next day is this one, a military coup, armed insurrection, or foreign intervention. If some of these options fail, there is a serious risk of civil war, a war that people will pay for with their blood. The same Venezuelan people you say you are defending. So I ask, is the Spanish government going to support a war or foreign intervention in Venezuela? 
Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has accused the Spanish Prime Minister of joining the coup against the Bolivarian government. Arreaza took to Twitter to respond to Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez, who called President Nicolás Maduro a tyrant. He says Sánchez is following the mandate of U.S. President Donald Trump. We now go to Colombia. Another campesino leader has been assassinated. The victim was Dilio Corpus Getio, a member of the campesino guards who was also associated with the National Agricultural Union. According to a representative from the Agricultural Union, Getio was hit by a vehicle and shot five times. The region has been highly impacted by violence, even after the peace agreement was signed in 2016. Now in 2019, four social leaders and human rights defenders have already been murdered in this area. We have more stories coming up. We'll be back. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur. Acompañamos a los pueblos que resisten en cada una de sus luchas. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. There are only a few days left until the presidential election in El Salvador. Our correspondent Ernesto Avalos explains to us how the country is preparing for these polls that are set for February 3rd. Only five days till the presidential elections on February the 3rd. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal said it has distributed the electoral materials in 13 of the 14 departments of the country. San Salvador, the department of the capital, will be the last to receive these materials, in which the National Civil Police will help deliver it. The National Civil Police will distribute the materials to around 25,000 electoral agents and administrative personnel. Moreover, they have informed people that the alcohol prohibition law will come into force a day before the elections and will be enforced on election day and a day after that. From El Salvador, there was Ernesto Avalos. And the United Nations has declared 2019 the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Bolivia will host at least two international events to raise awareness about the increasingly disappearing languages. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, has more. Bolivia, como país promotor del año Bolivia is at the forefront of efforts to promote and preserve this core part of cultural identity that is in danger of extinction. The country will host at least two international events to advocate for the preservation and revitalization of indigenous languages. One will focus on highlighting indigenous people and their languages as a source of knowledge, while the other one will showcase how indigenous languages contribute to development. It is estimated that there are about 800 indigenous peoples in Latin America, and 37 of those communities can be found in Bolivia. The Bolivian constitution, the 37 indigenous languages these indigenous peoples speak, as well as Spanish, are declared official languages. From Bolivia, Freddy Morales. In other news, the Mexican Congress has published a report on the results 
of the program to halt fuel theft across the country. Let's find out what has been achieved so far. Members of the Congress's permanent commission listened to a report about the progress of the program tackling fuel theft that the government of Andres Manuel López Obrador had commissioned. Special attention was given to finding out why fuel shortages continue in some Mexican states and the continuous attack on pipelines. The Tula Salamanca refineries have suffered from many theft operations. That is one of the main reasons why we still cannot achieve normality in the city of Guanajuato. The energy secretary said that the reasons behind fuel theft, locally known as Huaycol, are not purely economical. The areas these fuel pipelines are passing through and where the organized fuel thefts are happening are usually the more violent parts of our country. The Financial Intelligence Unit, whose representative also appeared before the Congress, reported that they have frozen assets of different people after linking them to money laundering or other illicit activities. We have blocked an account with $9.8 million and another with $35.4 million this month alone, which together surpasses the entire amount of money related to organized crime that the Attorney General froze in 2018. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador pointed out that some senior officials at the Mexican national oil company Pemex are under investigation but he won't disclose their names to avoid interfering with due process. Expert Ana Lilia Perez explains that there are hints that even the union leadership of the Pemex oil company is linked to criminal networks. Since the first investigations began into union employees regarding the alleged participation in fuel theft, the trade union leadership has been covering up for those employees. The Mexican government estimates that since the launch of the program to stop fuel theft, they have managed to prevent more than $263 million worth of fuel from being stolen. Now let's head to Africa. Across Nigeria, a two-day boycott of courts was called by the Nigerian Bar Association. The move comes in response to the suspension of the country's top judge, Walter Onogin. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari suspended the Chief Justice of Nigeria, who was facing charges, of failing to declare his assets. Lawyers have called the suspension a deliberate attack on the country's judiciary. Meanwhile, the US, the UK and the EU have all expressed concern over the move. <laughs> Police in Sudan used tear gas to disperse dozens of anti-government protesters in Khartoum on Tuesday. Meanwhile, Sudan's security chief has ordered the release of those detained during weeks of anti-government protests. The demonstrations were triggered by a worsening economic crisis. Protesters have called for President Omar al-Bashir to step down. The Prime Minister of the Central African Republic led a march calling for a global arms embargo to be lifted ahead of the UN meeting later this week. The country, racked by ethnic and religious conflicts, since 2013 has been subject to this embargo for the past five years. It bans weapons supplies to the country unless approved by a sanctions committee. On Thursday, the UN Security Council will decide whether it will be renewed. We are fed up with it. Regarding the embargo, France manipulates us a lot. We are in a sovereign country. Our army should defend us, but they didn't give our army the opportunity. Zimbabwe's High Court ordered the release of an activist and pastor, Iwan Mawarire, on Tuesday. Mawarire was in prison on subversion charges, and he was among those who mobilized people to protest after the government increased fuel prices. The violent protests have led to at least 12 deaths and have caused substantial damage to property. I'm holding a cup of uh, the judgment by Justice Tapi, uh, giving uh, Ivan Mawarire his uh, freedom. So in short, the court uh, basically agreed with uh, us in our submissions. Uh, and in the end, it uh, granted bail uh, to uh, Ivan on the charge that he is facing. A key witness in the ongoing probe into corruption under former South African President Jacob Zuma has admitted before the court that he is a racist. 
For days, former CEO of Bosasa Group, Angelo Agrisi, has given bombshell testimony before the commission. He's talked about bribes and favors he did for members of Suma's government. Now he's having to answer for a secret recording of him using racial slurs. Please, just understand the context. No sleep. I was besides myself, and I'm not going to make excuses. You can even hear me slur. I haven't made an excuse about this. But once again, Chair, I am a racist. I agree. Judge me on that. It's fine. The United Nations and the Nigerian government have launched a humanitarian strategy scheduled to run from this year until 2021. The plan targets the northeastern region of Nigeria and the neighboring countries of Cameroon, Chad and Niger. The UN is appealing for sustained humanitarian support during a surge in conflict and displacement in the region. This conflict has imposed untold suffering on millions of people, including women and children. Within a climate of insecurity and complete impunity, human rights violations, including sexual and gender-based violence, are systematically committed while communities are being destroyed with a ne negative impact on development. We're taking one last break, but stay with us. by inequalities, abuse of power, and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepen into the search of files which uncover the empire's strategies. Through our screen and web platform in English. The Empire Files with Abby Martin. Tuesday, only on. Our actions have an impact on the environment. It's our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve, and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. Press TV host Marcia Hashemi is expected to arrive back in Iran on Wednesday. The journalist who had a U.S. and Iranian citizenship was held in the United States on custody for 10 days. She was arrested and held as a material witness in an unnamed case. Hashemi's family alleged she suffered abuse during her incarceration. Efforts are underway to return children of self-proclaimed Islamic State fighters to their families in Tunisia. A delegation from the Tunisian government was in the Libyan city of Misurata collecting DNA from the children. Since ISIS was defeated in 2016, it's estimated 53 children of nine different nationalities have arrived at the city's Red Crescent Center for medical treatment. We returned some of these children to their families and to their countries of origin. Today we host a delegation from the Tunisian Foreign Ministry to take samples of DNA for six Tunisian children who live here. We cooperated with the ICRC in Misruta after identifying their relatives in the neighboring country Tunisia. The Islamic resistance movement in Palestine, Hamas, has announced the reopening of the only border crossing between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. The 
checkpoint has been closed for weeks following disagreements with the Palestinian Authority. Let's hear from Nayara Tardo, who has the latest. The Islamic resistance movement Hamas announced that the only entry point between the Gaza Strip and Egypt will reopen on Tuesday. It's important to remember that this checkpoint was closed due to a disagreement between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. There is still no confirmation of the opening by Egypt. The Rafah crossing is the only entry point between Gaza and the outside world. As it is under control by Israel and they don't allow Palestinians to leave the territory. That was Nayara Tardo from Egypt. In other news, a new Israeli attack on the Palestinian people has left eight protesters injured, according to Palestinian sources. The attack took place while Palestinians were protesting in the border valley, separating Sikkim Beach in the north of the Gaza Strip. While protesters threw rocks, Israeli forces responded with tear gas and gunfire, according to local sources. 20 boats were also trying to breach fishing limits imposed by Israel, where they were also reportedly repelled by Israeli fire. <laughs> Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko has announced his candidacy for another term in office. Poroshenko made the announcement in the capital, Kiev, he says he made the decision because he has a sense of responsibility to the country. He went on to define his main proposals, building Ukraine's relationship with NATO and the European Union. Elections will be held on March 31st. The threat of pro-Russian revenge, populism and authoritarianism are threats of different kind, but each of them is equally incompatible with Ukraine's European development. Each of them contradicts European political standards. Therefore, if you don't eliminate these threats, Ukraine will fall into the mortal embrace of Russia. My sense of deep responsibility for the country, for the current past, and for future generations has led me to make the decision and announce my candidacy for the post of President of Ukraine again. In Thailand, authorities in Bangkok closed hundreds of schools on Wednesday due to toxic smog. For weeks, the Thai capital has been covered in a murky haze that's prompted residents to wear masks on streets and on public transport. Meanwhile, the government has come under criticism for its slow response. The smog is being caused by cars and federal construction and pollution from factories. <laughs> I told my kids that whenever they go out, they have to cover their nose. Same for me. Sometimes I have a sore throat when I sleep. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And we're also on social media, so go ahead and follow us. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.